We are continuing from where we left off, which was at chapter 12, verse 14, in a short uh, response to what Gautam said, um, trying to witness, just, just because you, you put it in that form, uh, in, you phrased it that way, um, either one witnesses or one doesn't. There is no such thing as trying. For the simple reason that that's the fourth state, or it's not even a state, it's beyond the three states, and that's witnessing or shakshatkar. And that's, that's not about trying. The moment you are trying, that means you're not quite there. That's, of course, another topic. We will come to it another time as we go along reading the Bhagavad Gita. But since you just mentioned it and since you used that phrase, I just thought I'd, uh, I'd bring it up. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, we continue with the verses 14 to 16. He who without turning his mind to any other remembers me incessantly to that yogi who is ever united in yoga. I am easily available, O son of Pritha. Upon reaching me, the great souled one, having attained the supreme fulfillment, no longer comes to rebirth, which is an impermanent abode of sorrows. All the way to the realm of Brahman, all the worlds revolve again and again, O Arjuna. Upon reaching me, however, O son of Kunti, there is no more rebirth. It says quite clearly here that this plane of consciousness, this embodied state of consciousness, is not permanent. It is impermanent. We keep returning to this again and again. But on attaining that higher state where one remembers pure consciousness all the time, one is united in yoga and free from the cycle of birth, death and rebirth. How does one remember <clears throat> something incessantly, all the time, constantly? Is there anything that you can think of and remember all the time? Perhaps if you try, since we talked about it just now, trying to witness, trying to remember something constantly. If some of you have a personal deity, a family deity, whether you worship, whether you're Christian you, you, or, or Muslim, whichever background you come from, if there is a personal aspect of divinity that you uh, feel connected to, can you remember that all the time? Think about it. You get busy in your daily life. You get busy in the morning with getting ready for work. You get busy taking care of children. You get busy in your office responding to emails, responding to calls. Can you remember that personal deity all the time? I'm pretty sure that the answer for most of you is no. It's not possible to remember that deity all the time. The closest we can get is when you fall in love. Imagine the time you were a teenager, infatuated with somebody in your school and 
the first time you met your wife or husband and you fell in love. What happened then? If you remember those those moments, those those days or weeks or months, however long it was, you thought about this person all the time. Did you think about that person's name? No, you didn't think about a person's name all the time. So if it were a deity, I wouldn't say Krishna, Krishna all the time. If it were um, Goddess Durga, I wouldn't say Durga, Durga. And if it is your beloved one, your wife or your husband, you wouldn't be repeating that person's name either. Would you remember the person's face? Maybe, but not all the time. But when you were completely and madly in love, you still had a certain feeling which was there all the time. You felt a sense of joy, happiness, you felt on top of the world. And that is what is meant here. To remember that divinity all the time, constantly, incessantly, is like falling in love. You are not, however, in love with the person. You are in love with the divine. The all-encompassing, all-pervading. Even I just wanted to add here. Yeah. Um, a thought, because you mentioned, you know, thinking of somebody that we love. Hmm. Um, my experience is also that happens. I think of somebody very intensely, or even in pictures, somebody I don't like so much, or I'm very upset about. That's even sometimes stronger. You know, then that person's aura is also there. Of course, it's a negative side, but I'm sure we all have experienced that too. And yes, it's the same. It's the two sides of yeah. the same coin. We had mentioned it the last time when we spoke with Renu, I think it was, Renu, who asked about attachment, and I said aversion and attachment is the same. One is pushing and the other is pulling, but in, in the sense it is the same coloring, it's two sides of the same coin. So in a sense, yes, if you hate somebody intensely, it's a similar thing. It's, it's very similar. But we stick with the idea of love and we have often seen in spiritual traditions, one beautiful relationship that's always been highlighted, irrespective of the, the tradition it may be, the spiritual tradition, whether it is um, Christian, Islam, Hindu, Buddhist, all traditions of the world, that of mother and child. We have seen many pictures of Sri Krishna as a child, as a baby, with mother Yashoda. We have seen photos or pictures of baby Jesus and Mary and many such images. Why this image? It is, of course, a sign of unconditional love. But just imagine a mother, a young mother with a baby. Anybody who has had a, a child knows this, who has um, knows somebody who has had a baby recently would, would ex have experienced it or seen it, that a mother, a young mother with a baby is very intensely connected to her baby. She's thinking all the time about her baby, not in thoughts, not in thoughts really, but in feeling, in the heart. 
the baby is there continuously. So you can tell the mother, rest, and I'm going to take care of the baby. Still, the baby is always with the mother, mentally, emotionally, all the time. The bond is so strong between the two that nothing can come between the two. This, again, is an example of how the mind can be with that divinity is an example of how the mind can be with that divinity all the time. We cannot comprehend it always with an impersonal deity, you know, but we can relate to it when we see it in terms of a relationship with the beloved, somebody you fall in love with, or when you see a mother and baby together and see how deeply connected that they are, that the mother is always with her baby, in her thoughts and in the heart, emotionally, always with the baby. And this is what we are talking about here. Such a one is very easily united with yoga, in yoga. And once that unity takes place, you become a witness, then you don't need to try. You are a witness and you witness everything. When this happens, you are free from all sorrows. There is no returning to this human plane to acquire a body and live out desires because these are burnt in the fire of knowledge. Any thoughts or questions so far? Okay, we go to verses 17 to 19. A slight uh, caution here that the next few verses can be a little esoteric. Also, the following chapter is a little bit esoteric. And even if you don't follow everything, don't understand, it's okay. We'll just keep going. And sometimes these things reveal themselves, unfold themselves to us at a different time than we are ready. When we have gone through certain life experiences, you can come back to that and then it makes perfect sense. Sometimes it's just nice to hear the things even if they don't make immediate sense. To let them sit there and Eventually, when the time is ripe, these ideas come up again and they blossom, they flower and they reveal their secrets. Verses 17 to 19 People who know day and night know that the day of Brahma extends to a thousand aeons and the night extends to a thousand aeons also. All the manifest entities arise from the unmanifest upon the coming of the day and upon the coming of the night they dissolve into that very thing called the unmanifest. This aggregate of beings and elements, born again and again, is then dissolved at the coming of the night 
quite helplessly, O son of Pritha, and it is produced again upon the arrival of the day. Well, <laughs> that is about the day of Brahma. So some of you may have heard from Indian mythologies or from different readings of the Bhagavad Gita about the day of Brahma. And the day of Brahma is equal to thousands and thousands of our years. And so is the night. What is the meaning of this? These are, this is about pralaya, this is about the universe, about the macrocosm. All those who know a little bit in different spiritual traditions, there have always been concept of ages. So in the Indian tradition, we have the four ages, which is the Satyug, Dvapar, Tirta and Kali Yoga. So these are four ages and together they make up a Mahayoga or a great age. And then a thousand Mahayogas make one day of Brahma. This may sound esoteric and like mythological nonsense, a lot of people might think, but if you think about it carefully, doesn't this sound very similar to something we know from modern physics? You know, in modern physics also, we say that the universe expands, and then at some point of time, it starts contracting again and goes back, withdraws into the cosmic egg. This is one day of Brahma, the scientific equivalent of one day of Brahma. So you see the Bhagavad Gita the ancients knew what science is only just beginning to understand. A cyclical concept of the universe emerging out of the cosmic egg in a big bang and then eventually contracting and returning back to that. We call it pralay, the dissolution and then again the evolution. The dissolution or the return into the unmanifest is called night and the evolution or the emergence out of that cosmic egg into forms of different forms into manifestation is the day. All the beings, irrespective of which level of consciousness they are at, dissolve, return back to that very source, to the unmanifest form at the coming of the night. This cyclical form of time and of the universe was already understood by the ancients thousands of years ago, long before the advent of modern physics, quantum physics and um, astrophysics. Here we are talking about macrocosm. The same process 
also works for an individual in the microcosm where you dissolve back to the Jivatman and when the desires get active again, we manifest again to take another human form. So that is at an individual level. But the entire thing, the process of dissolution and evolution also takes place at a macro level, in the macrocosm. And here it is known as pralaya. Any thoughts? Any comments? I know it is esoteric and we don't have to really understand everything except why you should know this. Why is the Bhagavad Gita talking about these things? Why do you need to know this at all? Do we all need to study quantum physics and uh, modern physics to attain something in a spiritual journey? No, we don't. So why do we need to know this? I think Nadirat is just highlighting the cyclical nature of things that nothing is permanent. Yes. Is that? Yes, yes. That is, it's that it's all impermanent, yet at the same time, it is imperishable. In a way, everything is recycled. It all goes back, but it all comes back again. Nothing really dies. We get attached to all the things around us. You get attached to your new mobile phone. You get attached to your car, to your house. All these things. All these things are made of atoms which also will be destroyed and returned to that unmanifest form. Whether you see it from the perspective of modern physics and say it goes back into the egg or we see it in the form of spiritual wisdom where we say it is pralai and it all goes back to the unmanifest. Fact is, all this is imperishable. And at the same time, there is something behind this, the unmanifest, which is always the same, which is always eternal. And when we keep that larger perspective in our mind, we don't get so caught up with these little things in life. So it gives us a larger perspective. Any more comments or thoughts about this before we move on to the next? Okay, in that case. Verses 20 to 22. But beyond that primordial unmanifest Prakriti is another eternal unmanifest entity who does not perish when all the things perish. The unmanifest is called the indestructible syllable that is said to be the supreme status upon attaining which they no longer return to the world. That is my supreme abode. He is the transcendent self, Purusha, to be attained through devotion 
distracted toward none other, inside whom dwell all the beings and by whom is all this spanned and pervaded. So who is this Purusha? The cosmic self, pure consciousness, the imperishable, the indestructible syllable, that is Om. This unchanging, imperishable, this is our real and true nature. And when we understand this, even if we may not be identified with it, we begin to see that there is something besides the perishable. The perishable is known as Nashvar, that is destructible, perishable. So don't get attached to the Nashvar, to that which is perishable. Because that is going to go. Keep something higher in mind, the back of your mind. And that is the imperishable and eternal one. As I said that some of these verses are a little bit difficult to follow and verses 23 to 26 may also be a little bit um, tricky so let's see what they have to say. The time departing in which the yogis return or do not return I shall tell you of that time division, O bull among the Bharatas. Fire, light, the day, the moon lit fortnight, the six months of the northern solstice. Departing in that time, the people who know Brahman go to Brahman. Smoke, night, the lunar, the dark lunar fortnight, the six months of the Southern solstice. There the yogi attaining the lunar light returns. These white and dark directions of the world are said to be perennial. By one he no longer returns, by the other he returns again. There are two paths. One is the path of light, the other is the path of of darkness. This may sound um, um, in a sense judgmental, path of darkness, but it's just a way of explaining it. It doesn't mean that it's um, frightening or anything like this. What is the path of light? These verses are about the time you die. What is the best time? <laughs> I'm sure most of us don't really want to think about our death, let alone the best time to die. But there is indeed a good time to die. In verses 5 to 8, we talked about the fact that death was a chance to attain liberation. It was an opportunity. And in the verses 9 to 13, we explained, Bhagavad Gita explained in great detail how to leave the body consciously. That is the ideal way to leave the body, to depart or to, to go into death, which is a separation, to leave the body consciously. But that is a path for adepts. You need to know how to attain Kumbhak, how to pass through the Brahma uh, Nadi and to leave the body through the Sahasrara Chakra. What if you don't know how to do that? Are you doomed? 
well, there is another opportunity. These verses explain there are two possibilities. One is during the daytime, during the moonlit fortnight. You know there is a waxing moon and a waning moon. When the moon is getting smaller and waning to, towards the new moon, that's the darker fortnight. And when it is waxing and becoming a full moon, that's the brighter fortnight, the moonlit fortnight. Those two weeks are called Shukla or light. The darker fortnight is known as Krishna, that is the dark, the dark fortnight. So the moonlit fortnight, when the moon is growing, is more auspicious time. The six months when the sun is in the northern solstice, what is that time? Basically the summer time. In winter, the sun moves south. In summer, it moves north. So, the northern solstice when it is summer. These are the times when you would depart from your body, would be auspicious. On the other hand, to, to depart during the night, during the dark fortnight, that is the Krishna, the lunar fortnight which is dark, during this, the time of the winter months when it is generally darker, and the sun has gone down south. These are the times when it is inauspicious. And it is said that the yogi who leaves at this time returns. There is a still deeper meaning of this sun and moon. Sun is the path of the conscious mind. Moon is that of the unconscious mind. That means if you leave the body, then you are conscious, you are awake. Then you have a chance to go through that transition consciously. Those of us who are in our tradition and who may have a mantra may perhaps know this, that one of the things that you do with a mantra is that over the years you acquire proficiency in the mantra so that during the time of death, during the transition period, the mantra comes forward and leads you to the other shore. It's like you would sit in meditation and you are doing your mantra practice and you die. That would be then the solar path or the path of light. And you, your mantra would help you cross to the other shore safely and as consciously as possible. It may not be the same as a yogi who leaves his body consciously through the Sahasrara Chakra. But all the same, you have an opportunity to be conscious while dying. Often people say, when you ask, you know, you talk about death, they would say, people say, oh, I want to die peacefully in my sleep. Imagine you are dreaming and in your dream you die. And you don't know now whether you really died 
or it was a dream. It could have happened that you really die. All right? So that would be an unconscious death. And that is the dark path, the unconscious death. So essentially, the path of light, the path of the darkness, means a conscious death or an unconscious death. As far as possible, one should prepare oneself to die consciously. I know this is easier said than done. We prepare for many, many things. You know, these days people prepare for the birth of their children. They go for some courses. And they do all sorts of gymnastics. They learn everything about how the baby is delivered. They study books, especially when they're having the baby for the first time. So a lot of preparation is done for the birth. But no preparation is done for death. And we like to push away that thought because the thought is unpleasant. It activates one of the, the glaciers, the fifth glacier, that of fear, that of self-preservation. But we need to come to terms with that to prepare for it. What does Shibu have to say? He says, I heard that normal people become unconscious before death, leaving the body unconsciously, getting birth unconsciously, thus left the body consciously, they can choose their next birth. And those who leave the body consciously can choose their next birth. Yes, that's true. Most people are will die unconsciously and the whole process is totally unconscious. The very rare ones who leave their body consciously can choose their birth, their next birth. What does this mean to choose your next birth? It's a desire. It's a desire that you have and that goes into fulfillment. And if the person is really very conscious, he can, in that moment, also choose to let all the de desires burn up and be liberated. So, a conscious departure, and that's what these verses say, if you depart consciously, you do not have to return. But if you do not, you return again and again. Any questions, thoughts, comments? Difficult subject, I think, um, to face uh, death and to discuss it, since most of us um, like to act like we are never going to die. But unfortunately, there is only one thing that's certain, and that is death. Continue to the last verses of this chapter, verses 27 and 28. Knowing these two parts, no yogi is ever confused. Therefore, O Krishna, be united in yoga in all times. The fruit of merit that has been stated with regard to the Vedas, the sacrifices, ascetic endeavors and charities, 
The yogi surpasses it all, knowing this and attains the primal and supreme peace. So a yogi who knows both the paths is never confused. He is always united in yoga and it is surpassing all the knowledge of the Vedas, the sacrifices, all the tapas that you may do, the austerities, charities. And knowing these two paths, understanding these two paths, you attain primal supreme peace. The two paths are of Ida and Pingala. Two paths are the sun and the moon. What does it mean to understand two paths? It means to understand the working of the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. Using modern terminology, we all know that there's a conscious aspect to us. That part of your mind which is conscious is right now listening to what I'm saying. Unless you are doing something on Facebook while I'm talking. <laughs> and there is still an unconscious part which you are not really aware of. And as I'm talking and as you're listening to me talking about death, there may be thoughts in your unconscious mind about you getting old. There may be a picture of you as an old person. And that image is quickly suppressed by the conscious mind. There may be a thought of you getting sick, getting some terrible infection and some disease that is incurable, and dying a painful, miserable death. Quickly, the conscious mind takes over and this picture is also suppressed. Maybe there is a picture of you having an accident, getting totally mangled limbs and dying there. And that image is also suppressed. I'm sorry that I'm putting forward such images, but these images are already there in your mind. And they are being suppressed all the time. But the yogi who understands both the conscious mind as well as the unconscious mind. Such a yogi who is understanding both has basically understood the complete mind and therefore can go beyond it and attain the supreme peace which is pure consciousness becoming a witness. Please remember that these are not mere intellectual discussions. At least I hope that those of you who are attending regularly do not see this as mere intellectual discussion or um, something like, um, you, you know, studying, but uh, in, a, in a very kind of intellectual way. This is to be complemented with practice. I think almost all of you are from our tradition or have some connection to the tradition, to the teachers of this tradition, then you know that you have been given certain practices and eventually uh, a systematic practice will lead to progress and deeper understanding of the self, of your own self. If this becomes purely intellectual and is not supported by practice, that is systematic, then this will just remain very superficial. 
it will not be integrated. This kind of knowledge cannot be integrated without some kind of glimpse, a glimpse of, you know, some sort of attainment. If you do not have a systematic practice, you should find out how you can be guided systematically and helped so that all these things don't remain purely theoretical. That you do get a deeper understanding of your own conscious and unconscious mind. That you do know both these parts the solar as well as the lunar, so that you too can be a great yogi and not merely talk about great masters and sages and saints. And You should be ambitious. You should aspire to be like them. Do not be satisfied with just intellectual reading and intellectual understanding. Any comments? Any thoughts or questions? Uh, Radhika? Yes, Balaji? Uh, you mentioned about uh, the lot of thoughts that comes up and uh, the unconscious mind, uh, like with accidents and the diseases mm -hmm. uh, of death, uh, yeah. and the conscious mind trying to avoid it. Yeah. Uh, all these thoughts are present in the unconscious mind. Is it because of the past experiences, or the, the or uh, I'm just trying to understand? Uh, is it because of uh, everyone has experienced such uh, situations in their the previous genmas because of which uh, it is still lying in unconscious? Yes, yes. The the fear of death is very strong, and we have experienced this innumerable amounts of times, and it has always been associated with a certain pain of separation. Why pain of separation? Actually, death is not painful. You know, I can understand that if you have a painful death in the sense of, um, you know, you, you die, maybe you drown, or in that sense, of course, it would be painful and uncomfortable. But if you have a natural death, then it is not painful. But yet we experience pain of separation. And that pain of separation has been learned or has been conditioned innumerable times through innumerable lifetimes of attachment and aversion. You get attached to the people, you get attached to this plane of enjoyment and because of your ignorance, you, you think that you, you're not going to have it anymore. You're going to die and that's over. But the Bhagavad Gita keeps saying this again and again. It repeats itself many times. You are not going to die. You're going to come back again and you're going to enjoy this all over again as long as you have the desire. So you're going to return. Just don't get attached to anything. But people do get attached. And every time the same process they go through. When they die, they experience that pain of separation. And this pain of separation, through all those um, millions of times, has become so strong that it causes this experience of deep fear. And we don't quite know what it is because we don't have the memory of all these deaths or the separation, but we only have that pain which is there, that, that diffuse kind of fear which is always accompanying these, these thoughts. And when we come to terms with, with this, that, you know, we... we 
You're not attached to things. And when your, your attachment decreases, that fear itself will decrease. When your attachment to the body decreases, the fear of death will decrease. When you understand that you are eternal through a direct insight, a realization, not an intellectual understanding, then you know you're not really dying. You know that. Then fear disappears. And so we say our goal is to become fearless. Our goal is to become fearless, not stupid. So it doesn't mean you do stupid things and to prove how fearless you are. You know, you don't do dangerous things just to prove oh, how fearless I am. That's not what is meant by fearless. Fearless means that you do not feel that attachment to things around you and you know that you are eternal and imperishable. When you have that experience, all that which is in the unconscious mind, that which is stored there, will come forward. It will not harm you in any way and you that becomes conscious and that is then the path of light this is what we have learned over many many lifetimes the fear of death is learned by us and that is something we need to unlearn So, pretty intense um, session this time on understanding the mysteries of, of death. Oh, there's an ambulance passing by. So, a very, very intense um, session. You just let it sink in and... Next time we will continue with chapter 9. We won't go into chapter 9 now. It doesn't seem right since we only have 5 minutes to go to start an entirely new chapter now. The next chapter once again goes into the pralay, the, the macrocosm and the different manifestations of forms. Uh, very interesting chapter and so let's do it next time. Shibu says Jiva thinking the body is no more suitable for its karm. That's why it's leaving the body? I, I'm not sure what you mean by that, uh, Shibu. Um, why, you mean why we separate from the body? The body is perishable, Nashvar. Nashvar, you're getting attached to something that is perishable, Nashvar, and the body has to die. And yes, the body is then no longer suitable to live out its samskaras. It cannot live out its samskaras anymore, so it's time to leave the body and get a new one to live out its samskaras again. There's also a period of rest in between. Having manifested a certain amount of desires, you know, you feel a little bit satiated, you feel satisfied. It's like you eat food. You eat food, your hunger is satisfied. So you don't eat food immediately again. You wait for a while till you're hungry again, right? The hunger comes up again, then you eat food again. So similarly, when certain amount of samskaras have been lived out, they have been manifested and lived out, then there is a sense of satisfaction. You feel, oh, I lived a good life. I had a long and very fulfilling life. So when people who are very old, when they die, one says, oh, there is, you know, you don't have to feel, uh, feel sad about it because they led a very rich and fulfilling life. So, the mourning 
uh, which we experience when somebody very young dies is different. Because one says that this person, when a child dies, for example, uh, a very young person dies, you say, oh, um, he had a human body but was not able to live out his samskaras. And that is a reason for being sad or, or is uh, something we mourn about. But when someone has lived a very long, rich, fulfilling life, then you do not experience so much sorrow. We say, it's okay, they lived out their karma, their samskaras. And so, in a sense, they were, they were okay, you know, with, with whatever they lived out. Until you go to the, to that unmanifest state where you sleep, rest, and when the desires, like a seed, start growing, sprouting, then the desires start sprouting again, you take another body and come back to live out more desires or samskaras. And that's the process and that's the reason why we leave the body and the body is not suitable for living out its samskaras or when we have lived out a great deal of samskaras and we are in a sense satiated, it's enough now. I want to rest. It's like the day. You spend your whole day doing many activities and you rest at night. It's the same procedure. It's the same process. Sleep is therefore called Sahodara, little brother, little sister of death. That's why every night you rest a little bit. Those who have a lot of things to do in the day, very busy people, they have a lot to live out, they don't like to sleep. They want to work into the night. They do all sorts of things, whether they are having parties and enjoying their life or they are working or whatever they may be doing. They don't want to sleep. They don't want to rest. But at some point of time, they also have to rest because the body gets tired. The mind is satisfied. It begins to shut down. The same process is happening with the body as well. It's one of the laws of life, the, the dual laws of life, duality, of conscious and unconscious mind, the, the lunar and solar paths. It's happening all the time. Okay, so we stop here. It was a very intense session. And I hope... Um, some of you will be able to contemplate a little bit on it. If you cannot, that's okay. As I said, it may be too intense, partly. And um, if you think about death too long or fears come up, then it's, then it's um, maybe counterproductive, so go easy on it. Okay, have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye-bye, all. Bye, Debbie. Bye, Gautam. Bye, Shibu. Bye, McLosh.